Hello, everyone. This is Angie from TechServe Alliance. Welcome to today's webinar. Are you ready to propel your growth with M&A? The key steps to getting started in M&A for staffing executives. There will be a question and answer session following the presentation, so please write any questions you want answered in the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of the screen. We are also recording today's presentation, which will be available on the TechServe Alliance website and distributed to in follow-up emails. Now, I'd like to introduce you to Martin Brosco, Managing Partner at Becker. Thanks, Angie. A pleasure being here. Um, interesting, because usually when I'm doing these uh, presentations, we're talking more on the sales side of, of mergers and acquisitions. So um, this is a little bit different and, and exciting for me. I, I hope the audience enjoys it as well. And our topic is, um, you know, using mergers and acquisitions as a key tool in your arsenal to help uh, grow your staffing firm. Um, and, and we're going to try and um, look at this, you know, for folks who are thinking about making their first acquisition or whether or not they should make acquisitions. And there's certainly going to be a lot of content aimed at those folks. Um, but there's going to also be some places where I think we're going to dive in pretty deep. And for those folks who have made acquisitions, um, even who are serial acquirers, I think you'll you'll get some benefit this, from this as well. And in particular, I think folks are going to benefit because of the, the panel that I'm getting a chance to speak with today, which I'm uh, very excited about. Uh, first off, of course, is John Larson. If you, if you don't know John, I'll, I'll be surprised. But uh, John is obviously a industry veteran and and uh, runs TechServe's M&A Marketplace. John, it's always a pleasure to speak to you. Thanks, Marty. Appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. Yes, I'm looking forward to uh, interacting with you on this topic. And then, you know, everyone knows that UHY uh, Advisors is, is a major player in the tech staffing industry. And I've had the pleasure of working with Jeremy um, on a number of occasions on transactions and his team over at UHY. Um, like Becker, uh, UHY really focuses in on the staffing industry and, and spends time in the space. And Jeremy, it's a pleasure to have you uh, on board today. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, excited as well. This is a, a very interesting topic. Um, I think for anyone that follows the financial press or you see it in your businesses, there's a lot going on in staffing in general and M&A in general. And, um, you know, I think you could do this webinar every every month or so, and it'd be a little bit of a different theme and story. So um, yeah, excited for today. And uh, I think it'll be an interesting conversation. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And obviously this is a very broad topic, so we can't cover soup to nuts about uh, acquisitions. Uh, that would take a conference all to itself, honestly, to even try to tackle that. So so we're gonna hit some some areas that we think are key that are good for, areas for, for beginners, intermediate, and veterans in acquisitions. And we're going to start off, I think, um, with an overview of what the marketplace looks like. Then we're going to get into acquisition strategy. We're going to get into search strategies. And then we're going to get into to target evaluation. And, and John, you know, I don't think there's anybody better to kick us off with respect to what does the the IT tech staffing space marketplace look like today than you. So maybe you can share some insight on what the market looks like today. Thank you, Marty. Be glad to do that. Uh, the market is still hot. Uh, there's still a lot of activity in the, especially in the IT. And I think in some of the other sectors also, still good acquisition activity taking place. So I still see plenty of uh, buyers out there, plenty of sellers. Uh, and to the comment of the topic today, I'm seeing new buyers enter the marketplace. So there are folks that are taking a look at it and saying, okay, I think this is a, an opportunity. Now, relative to maybe what's happened in the past, I'll say six months, uh, there's a little uh, more uncertainty in the marketplace. It really hasn't changed the valuations. Uh, we're still seeing the enterprise value uh, remain solid. Uh, what I am noticing is a change in the terms. So, and I, and I think that's relative to the risk. Uh, as we have some economic uncertainty, I don't think industry uncertainty, but just general macroeconomic uncertainty, uh, that's introduced a little bit of risk into the uh, profile of the marketplace. And as a result, we're seeing some adjustment in the, in the terms 
uh, of a transaction, not so much in the enterprise value, but in the term. So I think that's going to continue. Uh, we anticipate that for, you know, well into next year. When you talk about the terms, uh, I imagine, for at least from what I'm seeing, and since we're we're on the buy side today, they're they're shifting a little bit more favorable to buyers. Was that fair to say, John? Yes, I think that's fair to say. Uh, the the buyers naturally in any transaction they want to uh, mitigate their risk as much as possible, and I think the the economics of the day uh, are causing them to really kind of adjust that uh, you know the 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 whole transaction aspect post you know post sale. Uh, what do we do to de-risk our situation? Uh, based upon the economics. And then I'll shift it over to, to Jeremy. So is is one of the primary shifts you're seeing in cash at close versus earnouts? Is that one of the primary shifts you're seeing in the marketplace? Yeah, it really is. And I think um, the way the two of you just kind of set that up, which is it's a shift, I think, in favor of the buyer. Um, and I think that's important because um, cash at close is a big one, right? And so if, if I'm a buyer, I want to, you know, one of the best ways to de-risk or mitigate risk on a deal is, you know, put 50% cash at close, which by the way, has been standard in staffing historically um, as kind of a starting point, 50 to 60%. And the rest gets paid out over time, maybe a year or two or three as an earnout, right? And so, um, you know, while historically staffing M&A has been you know, these deals have been getting closed at 50 to 60% cash at close. Buyers have been competing not just on value in the last 12 months or so, but also on cash at close. I've seen deals where, you know, buyers are paying a turn, a turn, a half a turn or a turn higher than maybe what the intrinsic value of the business is. And instead of 50 to 60% cash at close, I think in the first three deals, I uh, worked on quite a few of those with, uh, with Marty as well. First three deals of this year in staffing, cash at close was 90 to 100%, right? And that means no escrow in, in, in some of those deals as well. So that really puts buyers in a tough position. Um, and so I think the shift is probably similar to housing. I think it's been very difficult to be a buyer in this market because, you know, you have to compete on value. You have to compete uh, with aggressive deal terms to win these deals, uh, assuming a competitive process. And um, and that just that that puts buyers in a tough position. I think similar to housing, where you know, as a first-time home buyer, you're out there and you've got lines a mile long at these 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 open houses. I think that's changed with interest rates a bit. Again, it's not getting easier to buy a home, and I think it's still difficult as a buyer out there. But I think at the margin, we're seeing a little bit of a shift in cooling on some of that frenzied, um, aggressive behavior of, of other buyers in the marketplace by the way I position it. Yeah, I, I think that's what I, I've been seeing as well. I mean, we we did have a deal in the IT staffing space that we closed about 40 days ago and it it was still a hundred percent cash at close and it was a it was a significant size deal. Um so um there's still some aggressiveness in the economics, but but I'm starting to see a subtle shift uh, as well in, in the deals that we have. So I think that that sets the tone for where we are today. I think uh, in terms of the marketplace, it's shifting maybe towards a little bit more friendly to buyers, certainly still crowded marketplace. As, as John indicated, we have a lot of new buyers. I'd say, you know, COVID, post COVID, um, you know, we've had a lot of new buyers in the marketplace as compared to historically. Um, so let's shift gears and talk a little bit about acquisition strategy. And uh, that's the starting point. You know, are you going to acquire? Why are you going to acquire? Uh, maybe I'll start off here. So, you know, why are you going to acquire? It's, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a multifaceted question at, at its very simplest form. The, the reason folks make acquisitions is to drive up the value of their company, right? I mean, that's the simplest form for, for why you make acquisitions. And if you look at most of the, the major players in the IT staffing space, you know, almost without exception, they've all made acquisitions and, and made multiple acquisitions. Um, and if and if you go from broader and you look at the staffing industry in general, that that fact remains true, right? If you look at the outside of, of IT and you look at healthcare, you look at light industrial, you look at professional, 
Um, most of the major players have made acquisitions. And then if you step outside of our little world of staffing, I don't know if there is another world out there, but let's assume there's another world outside of the staffing industry. Um, you know, I hear um, that most of the major players in these other industries have made acquisitions too. So, so the question is why? Well, you know, why do most of the major players in, in industries make acquisitions? And I think the bottom line is that at some point it's hard to continue to grow organically. And you, you, you get to a point where growth is hard to come by. And, and the only way that you can, you can help accelerate or stimulate that or, or supplement that is, is through making acquisitions. So to me, that's, that's one end of it. And then there's, you know, there's secondary reasons to make acquisitions as well. Um, and to, to hit that bottom line. I mean, I've seen a lot of our, our clients make acquisitions to get into new territories, which is an obvious one, um, to uh, provide supplemental services. Uh, you know, interesting change in the overall marketplace in the last five years, five years ago, four years ago, three years ago, maybe even two years ago, nobody wanted anybody who was recruiting. They all wanted contingent workforce. Right? Now there's been a big shift. Recruiting is it, it proven to be incredibly valuable. The value of recruiting firms has gone up. And so now I see a lot of my clients who had focused so much on contingent side of their making acquisitions of recruiting firms, perm recruiting firms. So sometimes you want to round out your services. Um, you want to get talent. It's hard to find talent today, right? Marketplace for talent is very difficult. And uh, I'm not going to say an easy way because there's nothing easy about acquisitions, but one of the, the benefits of making acquisitions is a lot of time you pick up some talent. So, um, John, I'll throw it over to you. You know, what are some of your whys as to why people should consider making acquisitions? Well, I, I want to piggyback off what you just said about talent. Uh, the financials are the foundation for an acquisition. You know, can I increase value in the firm? You know, Value does accrue to scale as a general rule. And, uh, but the teams, we're finding more and more often uh, as buyers are looking you know, to acquire, they're looking at the team uh, just as hard as the financials. You know, what do they have in the way of, of professional salespeople, professional recruiters? You know, what's their infrastructure like relative to those processes? So, that's become more critical in my mind uh, than in the past. Very, very hard, as you said, to find good uh, internal talent uh, within the industry. I think another reason that uh, buyers take a look at is relative to the clients. Uh, oftentimes, or sometimes it's to service the client. They may have a, you know, they may be at a headquarters location, they need to support regional uh, locations for that large client. So I see that occasionally. Uh, sometimes uh, if I'm a smaller acquirer, I'm a smaller buyer, uh, sometimes it's to reduce my client concentration. So as I acquire a company, I'm going to add new clients. And as a result, that reduces my client concentration, which as I think most of us know, you know, that's a, that's a uh, I'll say a negative or a risk factor uh, on both the seller and the buyer side. So I think that's another reason that uh, people are looking, looking at uh, acquisitions. Thanks, John. Jeremy, anything to add on, on why or, or if you want to shift to, you know, how folks should start to think about act, their acquisition strategy and formulate that? Yeah, I think you, I think you covered a lot of the main topics. I mean, you know, what, one of the things I was going to say, which is, you know, sort of I think it covered a lot of the whys, right? But but for every company, there's there's a set of whys out there. And so I think, you know, if you're thinking about embarking on an acquisition strategy, probably one of the, you know, my biggest kind of recommendations is invest in the criteria identification process, right? It's step number one. It's uh, a lot of a lot of management teams, business owners, they think, well, I've already know these three organizations; they'd be a great fit. Let me just pick up the phone and call the owner and see if I can get things going. But what I recommend is pausing first, sit down with your team, right? Get some, get some, get a lot of input into this process, get it on the whiteboard. You know, what geographies do we want to enter? Which do we need to enter competitively? Um, which do we want to avoid for various reasons? 
Um, you talked to John talked about the team, right? Do we do we are we okay if the if the current management and ownership team are looking to kind of move on in the in the next year and we're going to kind of fill in around them, or do we need somebody that's going to stick around for the next three years? So I guess the point there is invest in the criteria process, uh, figure out all those aspects. What are the must-haves and what are the nice-to-haves, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're too particular in what you're looking for. There may not be any firms that that exactly fit what you're looking for. There might be a very small subset. On the other hand, if you're too broad, it can be a very distracting, time-consuming, and frustrating process to kind of make all these phone calls, all these outreaches. So I think I think spending time on a criteria process, find out what's critical, what's important, what's nice to have. Um, John, you mentioned geographically, right? So there might be a ge geography you want to enter, and I have a lot of times where our clients on the buy side, they're looking up flights, right? How easy is it to fly from my current location to this, this location? Is there a two hour drive time off the airport? It might sound kind of, kind of nuanced, but you know, how can I successfully manage that enterprise post-closing? That's really critical. So I think before you start kind of figuring out how do I start approaching these groups, I think that criteria phase is really critical. Um, and I think getting a lot of buying and input from from a broader team is a really important part of the buy side process. Yeah, I want to stay right there because I think that is critical because that rolls into the target evaluation, right? We're going to talk about target evaluation. Well, how the heck do you evaluate a target if you don't know what the criteria is that you're evaluating by, right? So, so John, you know, please, you know, continue on on what Jeremy's talking about about setting the criteria and the strategy. Well, I, I think it's a matter also, once you set that, to have the discipline to follow through. Uh, oftentimes, buyers and, or sellers, uh, they don't have the discipline internally. Uh, you know, they want to chase the newest shiny object, uh, or this sounds great. I think Jeremy is right on target and set your criteria, do it with your team, <clears throat> and, then, and then be disciplined in uh, doing that. And also, your strategy may be totally different uh, than somebody else's. Um, so that's the reason you need to know your company very well and understand what is it that we're really looking for. As, aside from the financials are the, still the foundation of it, but aside from that, what are the other components that'll make it a, a successful acquisition and accomplish the business objectives that, that my team or our team has set out, you know, set out to achieve? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I think for those folks who are who are either thinking about whether they should be making acquisitions or, or maybe have made one acquisition, to me, I think it's critical to understand that, at least in my opinion, with an acquisition strategy, it's it's kind of the old saying, you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound, right? You know, most folks are going to make multiple acquisitions. It takes multiple acquisitions usually to um accomplish your strategy right to 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 meet those criteria to you know usually um if you're doing a territory or a service ad or an industry ad it takes multiple acquisitions to really um accomplish what your goal is going to be um and you know it's also a little bit of a numbers game i i hate to say it but but i got the pleasure of working for I think eight industry firms that are what I would call serial acquirers and, and have been involved, you know, helping them through the acquisition process. And whenever I talk to them, you know, post the acquisition, six months later, a year later, two months later, how did that work out? How did that work out? Across the board from them, I get the following answers. I get mostly, yeah, well, then I get some, yeah, not so wells. But then I always get that was a home run, Marty. That that acquisition was a home run, right? And and if I had asked them all to tell me where that where each acquisition was going to be at closing, they all would have put them in the home run category, right? But but part of this is um, hitting timing and learning, right? Um, and so I think for folks who are 
maybe made an acquisition or thinking about acquisitions, I think you have to be ready to stay with it. it. It's typically not one acquisition and you're done to be successful. It's typically a longer term plan and strategy that works out. Um, Jeremy, shifting to you, it, it's not all, you know, uh, you know, it's not easy, right? This isn't easy. So maybe you can talk about some of the frustrations and dangers of, of going down the acquisition path and, and, and to do it to the novices, but maybe throw in some, some comments for folks who are serial acquirers as well. Yeah, great. I think, you know, it's just some of the, I've got a couple of frustrations that I think if you're out there doing deals, I think one very common one recently, um, particular for those that are typically serial acquirers and have had a history of success, which is as a buyer losing out on deals and um, losing out, even though you think you're overpaying or paying a very fair value for a business or offering to pay. Um, and so I think, you know, there, I don't know if I have a great solution to that other than to say that, look, it's been tough to be a buyer. I think some that have been quote unquote successful at acquiring some of these businesses, you know, they may look a year or two later and say, look, we overpaid or, you know, we really, we really would have been better served having a little bit less cash at close, a little bit more, um, earn out so we could have kind of de-risked the deal a little bit. So I think, you know, that's maybe just one thought or you know, kind of heads up going in, which is in a competitive deal market, which we continue to be in. Um, if you're losing deals, sometimes that's the best move for your business, right? When you, I always say that a really good due diligence process um, either confirms that there's a good acquisition you found or it kills a bad deal quickly. Um, so you know, I think, you know, to say that you've got to keep, you know, you got to overpay or compete with the market inconsistent with your criteria or your strategy, um, I think that's usually a, a bad decision. So, you know, that's one thing. I think another frustration for, I think, any deal is delays, right? And, um, you know, that's one thing where, I, you know, time kills deals is the way we, we, we typically say in the industry, and momentum is critical, right? So, you know, one recommendation is as a buyer, as soon as you sign that letter of intent, um, what I would highly recommend is having what we call a kickoff call with the seller, the seller's management team, get everyone on the phone, come up with a, a very timeline driven, milestone driven process. Here's where we're going to start our legal diligence. Here's where we're going to start our financial diligence or our quality of earnings. And by the way, we're going to put at the end of this a target close date. So everyone hears it. It's a date on the calendar. It's not sometime in November or in a couple of months or 30 to 90 days. It's so I think, you know, delays can really be a challenge and, and can be frustrating for buyers. Um, and so I think having a good process around that is important. You know, maybe one other kind of topic to bring up is um, as a buyer with an investment bank, investment banking led sale process, that's where I think you see the most competition. You see, as a buyer, you've got to compete with a higher value, typically more cash at close. Um, so I think finding ways to identify potential sellers who, um, you know, are, are not running as competitive a process or may have other critical points to them, like the treatment of the team post close. Um, they want to get out quickly. Um, so, you know, uh, try to find opportunities where you're competing, not just on value. And sometimes the way to do that is in a, you know, you find a seller develop a relationship on a one-off basis, develop trust, and negotiate a deal with, with a business owner directly as opposed to as part of a competitive process. John, from your perspective, um, you know, wh wh why do deals fail? What, what, because you have to know why they fail before you start, right? So that you can try and avoid those mistakes. Wh from, your, from your experience, why do you see deals fail? I, I would... Uh, agree with Jeremy, time kills all deals. So having a, you know, a timely process is <clears throat> very, very important. Uh, understanding the components. And, and I'm going to talk to the new, the new buyer here, somebody that maybe they've made their first acquisition or haven't made one, and they're thinking about it. Uh, it's very important that you do not go alone. Uh, to me, you need good counsel, you need good legal counsel on the front end. And, and this is not uh, your labor attorney or somebody that you've used for years in the firm. That may be where you gravitate, but you really need somebody with M&A experience that understands that, that M&A process. 
you know, Marty's done a great job in that over the years with his firm. Uh, Jeremy, UHY, they've done a great job. So it's not only having the legal, but also the, the financial, the uh, uh, counsel, because there, there are many nuances, whether it's a stock sale, asset sale, uh, or buy, and uh, you know, what are the tax ramifications? There's many, many elements that enter into it. So anyway, that's the time, and that's the, I think, the new buyer having that preparation is important in understanding the process. Uh, so that's a key element. I think the, to your point, Jeremy, finding those opportunities that may not be quite as competitive uh, is, a, is a good strategy. Yeah, being able to develop that relationship. I, and even on the sell side, I, I tell my folks, I said, the, the financial aspects are, are one piece of the picture of the enterprise value, but the terms are so critical to making a deal happen. So, you know, it's important as a new buyer that you're really listening. And, and yes, you're spending a, a good amount of money, whatever it happens to be for your size firm. Uh, but at the same time, really listen to that seller. And uh, what is it that, that what, are, what are the keys? You know, what lights them up? Uh, you made the comment earlier, you know, is the owner want to stay? They want to leave quickly. They will transition. You know, who's the number two person? you know, et cetera, et cetera. So all of those are, are really important uh, aspects of, of looking at it. But I, I think one of the big frustrations also, and uh, for any buyer, whether it's a serial buyer or the new buyer, uh, are the seller expectations. They're gonna get frustrated because the seller has unrealistic expectations if they do not have good counsel on that side. So sometimes, you know, bringing those two together takes time. It takes a dialogue, uh, but I, I understand, you know, a buyer being frustrated. This the seller doesn't understand the market. He doesn't understand the risks that we're taking, et cetera. So I, I see that uh, occur and it takes time to work through that. And hopefully the seller has appropriate counsel that's guiding them to say, okay, no, you know, I know you want 100% cash, but you're not going to get 100% cash. You know, let's have a different dialogue here uh, if you really want to sell your business. And uh, so we go from there. And I and I think piggybacking on the time kills all deals. And that's why, I mean, a lot of sellers, um, you know, this is their life's creation. And parting with it is, is a difficult thing to do. Um, and buyers have to always keep that in the back of their mind and they have to be ready to move because sometimes hesitation makes the makes the makes the seller hesitate and 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 change their mind. I, I want to talk a little bit more about search strategies. Um, I, I, but I want to first add one more comment on on you know why I've seen deals. And I'm going to talk about you're talking about why deals don't close the two of you. I want to talk about that kind of retrospective conversation I have with my clients and I ask them, well, okay, you made the acquisition. Why wasn't it what you thought it would be? So I'm going to go there for a couple seconds. And they always tell me a couple of things. And these are serial acquirers. Um, they, they say, we lost discipline in the transaction. That's the first one. They say, our glasses were too rosy in evaluating the transaction. And then the one they say most often is we just didn't integrate it well. Right. Um, so those are the three things when you're talking about not why a deal doesn't close, but why it's not successful. That's what they tell me. And and with respect to that, the discipline that they talk about is could be anywhere in the process. It could be, you know, this was really outside of our strategy. The criteria that Jeremy was talking about setting early on, I think, in his first response, it really was outside of that. You know, we, we, we our evaluation target evaluation process. Um, we kind of lost discipline and we didn't really go through our scorecards thoroughly. Or, you know what? We were just super busy when we made this acquisition and we didn't really go through our integration process well. So um, that leads to kind of a key thing and, and why, again, my saying is in for a penny, in for a pound, because you learn, right? That's where you can learn as you're making more acquisitions and, and end up with, with a better result. And then rose-colored glasses, you know, I always say, you're talking about teams, there has to be a skeptic on the team. People don't understand, but there has to be a skeptic on the acquisition team. Really because, 
Um, if there's not, you know, the tendency is if, if you've made that commitment to make acquisitions, the tendency is you want to make an acquisition and, and, and you're going to lose your discipline and, and you're going to get the rose colored glasses on. So you have to have a, a, a skeptic on. Um, and the biggest part place you have to be skeptical is during the target evaluation. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. So I'll stop it there. But you need that skeptic skeptic from when you find the target that you're in those discussions who's going to really say, what about this? I don't think that assumption is right. I don't think we can meet that, right? If we don't meet that, look what this looks like. That person has to be part of, of the team. Um, and then integration. I mean, folks who, who do this well have great processes to integrate their acquisitions, right? Culturally, technology, seamlessly, how they're going to maximize their sales, how, how they're going to, to make that criteria that they set out at first really come to life. It's all through the integration process. Uh, search strategies, John, though, I mean, Jeremy started to talk about them. I mean, you have to talk about the tech, tech serve marketplace. I mean, it's a great place for folks to shop for acquisitions, let's be honest. So, so why don't you talk about that and then some other uh, places where folks can, can search for, for targets. Thank you, Marty. <clears throat> yes, the TechServe marketplace is a great place to look for opportunities. Um, uh, very simply, we have over 80 buyer profiles. So buyers sign up. Um, oftentimes, they are first-time buyers. Uh, fill out a simple profile. This is what I'm looking for. So it's, it's I'll say, a first cut um, at uh, you know what their search strategy uh, you know, is at that particular point in time. So tech serves one place. Uh, I know there are other uh, areas. Uh, SIA puts out a list of uh, an annual buyers list. So that's a good place to, uh, you know, get your name out there if you're a, a new buyer. Uh, the ser serial buyers are already on that list. I can assure you uh, the large folks are already on the SIA list. So that's a good one. Uh, there are numerous uh, brokers that deal in the staffing industry. So those brokers are very active and many of them are very, very good, uh, provide a, a very solid service. Uh, so, you know, they always uh, are looking for, you know, they usually are on the sell side. So uh, they're looking for good buyers. So that's a, a way to get your name out there. Uh, investment bankers. Uh, sometimes the investment bankers are dealing with the larger uh, scenarios or larger opportunities, uh, but at the same time, they run across a, a, a lot of opportunities that may not be a fit for them, uh, maybe not the right size, et cetera. So, you know, it's still a good way to network uh, within the industry. Um, and I've, I always used uh, my peer groups, the CEO roundtables that you're a member of, uh, maybe the, the national meetings that you go to, uh, like the, the TechServe conference is coming up in November. I know there's a, a lot of discussion, a lot of dialogue that takes place, you know, in the corridors and in the, you know, the coffee shops and, the, you know, whatever it happens to be. So that's another good place to, uh, you know, look for opportunities. So I think the key is always be looking. If, if you have the attitude that, okay, well, I'm ready to make an acquisition and I'm just going to do X, whatever X is, it's going to be very difficult to be successful. You need to have a pretty broad strategy for looking uh, and searching as long as you have a very narrow criteria for what it is you want to, uh, you know, you want to, you want to find. Yeah, I think that's, that's really important. It's energy and effort and discipline. And if you don't have all three of those, in this marketplace, it's going to be hard. Jeremy, you, 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 I know represent folks on the buy side and in, in helping them uh, find targets. Talk about some of the work that that you do with your clients, what you find successful, what works for you in terms of uh, locating targets for your clients. Yeah, I think um, as John mentioned, you know, TechServe, great resource. There's there's a lot of great resources out there where if you're a buyer. Um, you know, can get connected with, with, with sellers in the market today. I think, you know, one of the services that we provide, we call it a buy side search process. Um, we find these to be uh, very valuable to um, staffing companies that are looking to grow through acquisition. And I'd say maybe the one reason is because I think a lot of 
you know, as you're kind of starting off, maybe you've kind of done everything on the criteria front and you figured out, all right, here's what I'm looking for. And then you sort of, let's say you come up with that list of, of companies that fit the majority of those uh, um, aspects of what you're looking for. The next thing you have to do is you've got to reach out to these firms. And one of the things that I've seen occur is that, you know, the CEO, the owner, the president, uh, senior management teams, you know, they start picking up the phone and what they find out is they're getting a lot of no's. You know, thanks for calling. I'm not interested in selling. Thanks for calling. Um, you know, now is not the right time. And so what, what ends up happening after a few of those phone calls, well, let's pass it in, pass that along to, you know, our business development team or mid-level management. And next thing you know, they make about 10 of those phone calls and, you know, nine of those people don't want them to call them back. And it's frustrating. And I, I what I see is that there's burnout in the process. And next thing you know, you don't really have an active growth through acquisition strategy. And so one of the things that, that we help business owners and, and management teams do is we offload a lot of that work, right? So we're basically, um, you know, it, it's, it's starting with the criteria phase, right? You know, we're, we're helping, we're making sure those meetings are happening, making sure, Marty, to your point that we've got, you know, folks that are asking the, the tough questions. Is this really something we need? Can we really, gr can we really grow on the West Coast, if we're East Coast focused today, is that a little bit too much for us for the first acquisition? Um, but I think one of the um, one of the best things that we can do is sort of take some of that frustration off the plate. Whereas, you know, we kind of have a very well-oiled machine and process where we're reaching out to these groups, we're following up with emails, phone calls, voicemails. We're looking to get no's, and it's just it's just a part of what we do. And um, so it does kind of take some of that off. I think the other thing that um, we've talked about a bit today is um, seller value expectations. Um, uh, this is maybe a little bit off topic, but relative to the process that we like to run, I think you know you've got to kind of have the end game in mind to some degree. So when you find a nice target, you know, kind of fits all the parameters, you have an initial dialogue. I think I think sort of having a plan in place to getting to a proposal as a buyer quickly is really important because. Um, again, if, if, if a business is worth six times EBITDA and, you know, you propose, you know, five and a half to six and a half to the seller and they say, no, I think my business is worth 10, we want to find that out right away. You don't want to spend three months doing due diligence only to find out that you could have asked the question early on. And so um, that's also part of our buy side search process, which is, you know, we kind of do a lot of the, the, the grunt work and the, the part of the process that is not fun. Um, but also um, help to make sure we're driving efficiency uh, in the process. I think maybe my last quick point here uh, goes back to something that Marty mentioned, which is doing a number of deals is really important. And I think one of the ways I kind of look at that is, you know, after your first deal um, as, a, as a team, as a management team, you, you've learned a lot. You've learned a lot of what works, what doesn't work, what we're going to do again next time, what we're definitely not going to do again next time. Um, and you build that M&A muscle. So on the second deal, certainly the third deal, you know, the team gets more reps and more experience nailing that criteria phase, right? Um, asking the right questions, knowing how to get a proposal pulled together quickly, um, just getting overall, you know, corporate alignment on the strategy and making the, fish, the, the process as, as efficient as possible. I think that's a, that's a good point. To me, just to piggyback, I don't remember, I, I think it was John who mentioned this about networking, right? Kind of what I'd call grassroots approach. Uh, a lot of the folks that we work with are just really good at networking and they're they're at the Tech Serve Alliance National Conference. They're at the regional and local Tech Serve Alliance meetings. Uh, they're at SIA Executive Health Ground. I have one client that formed his own study group and brought in other, this is in the healthcare staffing industry, before each um, SIA healthcare forum, they would go together a day before, and he would invite some other folks in that, that were his competitors, and they would do a little study group. Well, he ended up buying four of his study group members. Um, and, and that's why he started that study group was, was for those opportunities. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of w ways that you can go out and try and identify targets. And, and I think from hearing from the two of you, and I agree, 
you know, it's just having the, the energy and the effort to, to keep out there. John, you know, what are you up against in the marketplace today? I mean, you're 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 right in it at the TechServe Alliance marketplace. What what are buyers facing in terms of trying to find targets today? What does it look like? Uh, I think I think there there are plenty of targets. I think consistency is a big part of it. So I think as a new buyer, uh, I hate to use the adage, but you're going to kiss a lot of frogs to find the print. So you you really need to uh, have the energy and have the discipline to be looking at multiple opportunities. So I don't think there's a, a problem finding the opportunities. The challenge is, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, is, okay, making sure we find the right opportunity. Uh, kind of a comment that goes along with that. I think one of the challenges, especially for a new buyer uh, in the marketplace, do they have the, have they set aside the internal time or personnel to pursue? Uh, oftentimes I see fits and starts. Okay, we, we spend a couple of weeks on it. Well, we didn't find anybody, so it goes fallow, you know, it goes quiet. Um, I know when I had my own firm, I, I had a partner, thankfully, and we, we finally figured out through trial and error that, okay, one of us has to focus on that totally. So, he ran the day-to-day -day operations and, and I went searching for companies and talking to the banks and financial people, all that type of stuff. So you have to have the discipline to continue the pursuit and you're gonna to talk to a lot of people that it come, it may come for naught, but you're learning in that process. So you're gaining intellectual knowledge, you know, for your own organization to, that's better for the next one. Um, so I, th I think as a, as a new buyer, having that internal discipline to continue that quest on a consistent basis is uh, absolutely critical. And because you can't, you can't take too much time away from your current operations, you know, and, and maybe if you're a, a first time buyer, okay, whose responsibility is that? Is it CEO? Do you have a business development person, you know, uh, my VP of sales or my COO or whatever it happens to be. So understanding whose primary responsibility and who's being held accountable for it and what resources do they need from the organization to, to move that forward. I think all of the firms that I think are very successful at this just build it in as part of their operations, right? You've got your recruiters, you got your compliance folks, you got your accountants, and then you got your folks designated to to to, to this process. And there may be some overlap, but but it just has to be built into the into the operations. Um, let's shift into our last topic, and and this is where I think we'll dive a little bit deeper. Um, target evaluation, um, and we've hinted at it a little bit throughout this conversation and scratched the surface, but I, I really do want to jump in, you know, wholeheartedly. And I, and I think the place where I start is going back to what you said, Jeremy, this is, you know, relates to the criteria you set during your, your strategy, right? So you have to turn that to me. Um, I've been lucky enough to be on some evaluation um committees for some clients especially early on in their acquisition uh you know processes are making their first couple um and all the ones that do it well create a scorecard i call it um and they take that criteria you were talking about that they set as their strategy what their goals were what they're trying to accomplish and they create a scorecard to evaluate their targets and usually and they all look different but usually they have some things in common from what i've seen and and there's always two aspects to it. There's what I call the financial scorecard and kind of the intangible scorecard, right? Those are what I, I see. And the financial scorecard is what I call a pro forma, right? They, they take a look and A, they, they're gonna evaluate the target's financials and see if it fits into the criteria, right? Are their margins the same or they have completely different margins? Their margins are a lot lower. How are we dealing with that, right? So there's a financial analysis of the target. Then there's a financial analysis of what's the combination gonna look like when we roll those folks in, that there's pro forma calculations of that. And that's where we start looking at, and I know Jeremy and John, I'm gonna ask you guys to, to talk about this a little bit more. We talk start to talk about revenue and cost synergies, right? So um, yeah, we're gonna buy their EBITDA and hopefully it's all gonna come over, but, but if there's, 
revenue synergies, we're going to grow that, right? Um, so uh, rolling in those revenue and cost synergies that you're going to talk about and coming up with, okay, now this is what the combined organization looks like. And does that make our criteria? So that's the financial scorecard in kind of a really abbreviated uh, version. Then you have the intangible scorecard. Um, and, you know, what's the location? What's the culture? But really important. What's the culture? Is it the same as ours? Involved in a transaction. It was funny. I was just this, this wasn't even in my mind when we were going to speak today. But Jeremy, you talked about being an East Coast. I think your example was a, I'm an East Coast staffing firm and I'm going to buy a West Coast staffing firm. Well, four or five years ago in the tech staffing industry, I was representing a seller, West Coast seller, very, very professional, buttoned up East Coast PE firm. We had a very um, casual, um, open West Coast IT staffing firm, and the P East Coast PE firm bought the West Coast staffing firm, and they would never admit it, but I'm going to say it. It was a disaster culturally. People left, um, and it just wasn't a cultural fit. So what's your culture, and is their culture close? Technology, right? That's an intangible. That, how's that going to work? Compliance. Uh, I have uh, a number of clients on the buy side who are very compliance oriented. And so they're only going to look for firms that are likely, likewise compliant oriented. I have one buyer who is less compliance oriented. And, you know, he, he doesn't really care as much about what the acquis the target's compliance looks like. So, you know, that's kind of the intangible scorecard. Again, I've simplified both, but, but that to me is the start of, of target uh, valuation. Um, I don't know, Jeremy, what your thoughts on, on the valuation process and, and some things that you really recommend when folks finally have found somebody to speak to and are trying to figure out if it's the, the right company to buy. Yeah, I think you covered a lot of it there. I think it does go back to process, 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 right? Um, having a scorecard, I mean, that's step number one. And I think as we've talked about throughout the day, it's 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 bringing in folks, you know, so you know, who's going to kind of evaluate that scorecard, right? Sort of your M&A team. But to your point, Marty, you know, there's if there's some technology similarities, which is a plus on the scorecard. And and if there's some differences, there's going to be some integration challenges or some software update requirements. Um, pull in folks from IT, right? It doesn't have to be a full team, but but get someone on your M&A team that can represent the IT function of the business. Um, they're going to know better, you know, what the solution looks like. So I think as it relates to your scorecard, whether it's financial, quantitative, or qualitative topics, um, you know, some, some categories are going to rate very well. That's good. Some are going to rate lower than others. And, you know, in those categories, I think then you got to dig in and figure out, well, what's the solution? What's the risk there? How do we mitigate the risk? It might be, um, via a lower purchase price, right? The, the company just has lower margins and that's just, that is what it is. Or maybe it's this target company has lower margins. We know why we have resources that can fix that. And so we've got kind of a solution on our side, ready to roll there. Or is it someone, are there some hires we need to make to run that organization better or more efficiently? So I think it's making sure you've got the scorecard, making sure everyone that's evaluating that scorecard um, make sure you have the right people in the room to do that, to get through that exercise completely. And then just for every aspect where it isn't a, on a 10 scale, if it's a five or below, um, really dig in and figure out, is this a deal killer? Um, can we create a solution easily? Um, can we create a solution, but it's going to take us a year and a lot of hard work and there's risk there. And then if that's the case, how do we de-risk that, that piece of the deal for ourselves? Um, it may be deal structure. Um, it may be in performance-based earnout, a uh, whole host of things. But I think it's just, just being very strategic in your process about the scorecard uh, piece of this. And to your point, Marty, be disciplined. The, the point in the deal where it's easiest to lose discipline is at the 11th hour. Both the buyer and the seller are, are sort of thinking, well, you know, I've invested all this time, energy, effort, and resources. You know, I just found out that, you know, <laughs> uh, margins are actually a percent lower than, than I've been thinking the whole time. Uh, we'll just close over that. Well, 
that's tempting. But I think just being disciplined, especially near the end, everyone's invested a lot of time and effort and energy. But as a buyer, you know, you own that deal. You own the outcome. Marty, a lot of, lot of strong stories, a lot of negative stories, but, and you have, you have to own that piece of it. So just making sure that um, you're staying disciplined throughout the process from start to close and post close. John, I'd love to have you add, and then I'd love to have you tackle either revenue synergies or cost synergies, one of those two, and, you know, just make sure everybody understands what they are and the importance of considering those in target evaluation. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll touch on both of those, Marty, uh, from a revenue and cost standpoint. One thing, kind of a foundation that I want to lay right here is that as, as a buyer and you're creating that scorecard, uh, Oftentimes people want something that looks exactly like us. Okay. So the tendency is, okay, well, I want another company to acquire that looks just like us. And that may, it may be appropriate, but then again, I'd, I'd caution you to have an, a little broader uh, mind, be a little more open on that opportunity. Um, on, the, on the revenue is a good example. You know, where is that revenue coming from? You know, is it, uh, you know, the traditional face-to-face -face customer. Uh, if, I, if that's my business profile and I'm looking at a target that has uh, VMS, okay, or MSP business, is that an automatic, you know, we may have put on our scorecard, I, I don't want that business because it's lower margin. Well, we need to be taking a look at that. Is that really the appropriate way to look at it in, in the scorecard? That revenue can I accrue that revenue and uh, reduce my overall cost? So it may be a different type of revenue stream, uh, but at the same time, it may accrue other benefits you know, to the organization. So look at revenue there. Uh, you made the comment earlier, uh, firms are targeting the direct hire firms. So does the firm have direct hire that can improve the, the margin? So they may have some uh, traditional revenue, which is at lower margin, but they also have a good solid foundation for direct hire or perm placement, depending upon your terminology, that helps uh, enhance uh, the overall gross margin. Uh, so I'd, I'd be taking a look at that. So different types of revenue streams. Uh, from the cost standpoint, uh, this is oftentimes a challenge. Uh, there should be some cost to be uh, uh, get or reduced, as say, maybe not necessarily reduced, but the overall cost uh, should accrue to that buyer uh, as far as you know overall reduction, which should improve my operating income or my net income line. So it could be in the services that I'm providing internally. Uh, could very well be that the as a buyer. I already have the infrastructure all set up that I can that I can integrate additional transactional volume into my business with no increase in cost. That may allow me to reduce it on the seller side. Um, so that's something. But to the comment earlier, you have to have a very good disciplined integration plan in order for that to take place. Uh, the other thing that that I would be looking at in the revenue cost synergies, look at your target. So as a buyer, you're very comfortable with your process. You're very comfortable that you know it's, it's efficient. You've worked at that over the years and uh, you're producing a good bottom line. There may be something to be learned from that seller. They may have a process that you don't have that you could actually integrate, kind of, kind of the reverse ah, they're doing it differently than we do. And wow, it looks like it may be more efficient. Um, so I would encourage you to look at, at uh, cost synergies from the, from the other side uh, as you go about it. Uh, that's Those a great point. I'd be looking at. Oh, sorry, John. I thought you'd finish. No, I am. Okay. Uh, no, I think that's a great point. I mean, I think that you know, with revenue synergies and cost synergies, I think again, and I keep using the same phrase, I think that's where folks tend to overestimate, right? They, 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 they look at the revenue synergies and they say, oh, well, we're gonna turn X to Y and, um, and that's easy. All we have, you know, or 
the cost synergies. You know, we're going to be able to get rid of these four or five people, um, and and our overall accrued expenses are going to be lower. I think that that you have to be really disciplined with that. Um, I know some of our clients who will, you know, have their peers. For instance, one client has peer serial acquirers in other industries, right? That they talk to, and one of the things they talk about is, you know, when have you overestimated your revenue synergies, and why did you overestimate your revenue synergy? What caused you? What did you learn? Because it's, you know, that that can tend to be the tendency. Um, so I, I think that's uh, really important because that's an area where, um, hey, that's where you can hit the home run, right? Where I talked about earlier, I opened up with, you know, did well on this one, maybe not so well on this one. Oh, oh my God, home run here. That, that's where you hit the home run. But that's also where you can have the didn't do so well. So um, I think um, last question, and then we'll open it up for questions. And, and this is uh, to take it wherever you, you want to go. Um, you know, Jeremy, why don't you start off? Just you know, share something you haven't shared so far in this conversation that you think is uh, really important for folks to think about. Love the question, Marty, because I was thinking. Uh, so I think John brought something up earlier on, and I wrote a note to, to mention the word emotions, right? Because I think as it comes to to M and A and as a buyer, um, you know, investment bankers, we're thinking, you know financials and accounting and negotiation and deal strategy. But at the end of the day, there's a, another human being on the other side of this deal. Um, the seller, particularly for, you know, smaller family owned companies, um, I'd say oftentimes 80% of deals are emotion and only about 20% are financial. Um, yeah. And, you know, sometimes this is a, it's like a member of the family to them. So um, just know your audience and, you know, uh, listen, um, what's important to you? Because at the end of the day, the challenge is with any deal, there's going to be some things you find out in diligence as a buyer where you got to go back to that business owner and say, hey, look, I know I agree to, you know, a $15 million purchase price, but I didn't know, <laughs> you know, we had this, this, this piece of the cost structure is going to increase next year. And here, you know, so you want to create that pathway towards um, good communication, good lines of communication, building trust. Um, because there are emotional pieces of deals that can kill a deal at the 11th hour. Um, you know, it's an exhausting process. A lot of deals can take six, all of six months or longer. Um, and, and as a business owner that hasn't been this, through this before, as a seller, um, they're going to be tired by the time we're getting close to, close to the closing time. So um, just keeping in mind that emotions are really critical uh, in these processes and just think of ways to, um, Keep, keep that active dialogue, keep that trust, because um, things are going to occur from time to time in a deal that um, it's going to be very valuable. John, your turn. Yeah, I, I would agree with Jeremy. He made a comment about communication, and it's a joint communication process uh, on both sides. Uh, on, on the seller, they need to be very transparent uh, in the information they're provided or providing, uh, because it's going to come out in due diligence. Uh, the sellers do not understand the level of due diligence that's required in a successful transaction. As Jeremy said, everyone's tired uh, as you get towards the end. So that joint communication. Uh, also, to the, to the emotional aspect, uh, virtually every deal that I've been involved with, uh, there is emotion uh, involved. And it's, not, it's generally not over the money. It's over the people. Uh, and the owner, they want to make sure that their team's being taken care of. Uh, you know, they really have a heart. It, like you said, it's a member of the family. Uh, so as a result of that, that communication and from a buyer standpoint, how you're treating people is, is oh so important. Um, yes, there's a, there's a check being written and money being transferred, all that type of thing. Uh, but it really is about people. And if you'll remember that as a buyer, uh, you'll have a much better opportunity to have a, having a successful uh, transaction on your hands. I think that's leads pretty nicely into what my closing comment is. I think that, that the buyers sometimes don't understand their se themselves well enough. Um, you know, uh, and I, and I can, and I see this in two ways. 
uh, on tangible and intangible. I, I've worked on the tangible and the financial. I've, I've worked with a buyer who was making acquisitions under the assumption that when he transitioned and he sold, he would have he had a certain value. And, you know, that value wasn't quite correct. It was overstated. Um, so and he did very well, don't get me wrong. But but if he had had his value correct, his own company value, um, he probably would have had a little bit different pricing strategy for his acquisitions and would have done even a little bit better. And this is I mean, these folks did really well, but but if I, I've talked to them and they've said, you know what, we slightly overestimated what our value was going to be. And so we were slightly overpaying for all of our targets. So so really, you know, know yourself. And then the same thing that goes with the intangible, like, John, you 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 picked it up, right? There are things that you can pick up from your sellers, processes, talents, people that are better than yours, right? Be open to that um and 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 look for that um and then also really understand your culture some buyers don't really understand their culture they think they have a certain culture and and maybe they don't um and then you know when they when they acquire they don't evaluate the the culture of the other company uh as well and, and whether or not that'll be a fit as well as as they should so you know my advice is is there's a lot of uh introspection that has to take place if you're going to be on the buy side. So um, I don't think we have time for Q&A now, unfortunately. Uh, you get, put a lawyer in charge of anything and, and you're, you know, you're always going to have a little bit too much talking. I apologize to the audience uh, for that. Um, but I know John and, and I know Jeremy and, and me as well. So if you do have any questions, you know, I'm always happy to spend some time with, with, with TechServe community and answer questions off the clock. I know Jeremy is and 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 John is never off the clock for, for TechServe. So uh, any one of us will be happy to answer any questions. And with that, I'm going to send it back over to you, Angie. A big thank you to Marty, Jeremy, and John, and thank you all for joining. We ask that you please fill out the survey upon exiting this webinar. Our next scheduled webinar will be State of the Industry, an executive webinar series on Tuesday, October 11th at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Also, just a reminder that this year's Executive Summit is scheduled for November 7th through 9th at the La Quinta Resort in Palm Springs, California. Please send any further questions to staff at techservalliance.org. Thank you and have a wonderful day.